No, it's a little bit of a misnomer. There's nothing sort of critical in the sense of analytical about it. This is an indoctrination program, pure and simple. It's based upon, I would call it a cartoon view of American history. All of all Americans, past and present, are divided into the oppressor class or the oppressed. Now, this was a, a Marxist category. Marx divided people into basically the working class and the capitalist class. Essentially, what these guys do is they take the Marxist category, but they substitute class for, they make race substitute for class. So now they're not looking at the rich against the poor. They're looking against black against white. So on the one side, you've got the evil white oppressors. Uh, they're even more oppressive if they're white and male. And the worst thing to be is white, male, and heterosexual. Then you are an intersectional criminal of sorts. On the other hand, on the victim side, it's pretty good to be Latino or black. It's even better if you're a Latino woman. And if you're a handicapped Latino woman of color who's also a transsexual, you basically scored big time. So it's this kind of a, I would call it almost a caricature view that is now, there's nothing funny about the way it's taught. It's taught as stern dogma. People who deny it are said to be deniers, and, and there are all kinds of penalties that they use to demonize people. So this is the opposite of education, which should be about openness and discussion. Instead, young people who have done nothing wrong, who have not oppressed or discriminated against anybody, are made to feel like they're slave owners or that they bear the moral weight of the slave owners because they are, in, in theory at least, descended from them. Hmm. All right, well, I guess I'm the criminal then. Um, as a white heterosexual male, that's problematic. But, you know, Dinesh, it's not just um, at this elementary and high school level right now, right? Colleges are dealing with this as well. There was a uh, professor at Roosevelt University who serves on the board of a local high school who was caught admitting that she likes pushing social justice to the classroom. Let me, let me play you what she said. You fit in so well with their, you know, the university's philosophy and mission, right? I mean, it's all social justice all day, every day. I get to talk about all the things I love all the time. So, Dinesh, you know, the thing that was weird there is it's not here's what I'm teaching the kids. Here's what I want to push, not what they need to learn. No, I mean, this is actually not a lot of these teachers now feel that whatever subjects they teach, mathematics has got to be now seen through the lens of social justice. Now, an ordinary person may say, what? You know, in what sense is algebra equations? Are you saying that mathematics, the way I learned it for, I mean, I learned it in India. Is it is it racially biased? That's nonsense. I mean, this is the this is basically what makes airplanes fly and, and spacecraft voyagers go to the moon. So nevertheless, these people with a kind of deadly seriousness will say things like, no, Dinesh, don't you understand that the math problems when they're given to groups of Latino, black and, and Asian students, the Asian students all do the best. Whites come in second, Latinos come in third, blacks come in at the bottom. Therefore, there's proof, and what more proof could be needed that these equations must be racially biased? How else are they producing these biased outcomes? Wow. You know, it's interesting as we have seen all students go online, parents have been able to have um, more of an account of what they're learning. But it's interesting because President Biden and the First Lady recently visited elementary school in Virginia where they asked students what they thought about virtual learning. And here's what they said. They said it was, quote, terrible. It was difficult with all the glitches, technical glitches, that is. But they liked being able to turn their cameras off and take naps and eat snacks. I mean, this is the true picture of what kids would want to do right if there is not control in a classroom kids really do need to get back to the classroom biden says that it's going to happen this fall uh but how realistic do you think that is because it seems like they just keep pushing the goalpost here yeah i mean there's a line in shakespeare about the little schoolboy with his satchel and shakespeare says crawling like a snail unwillingly to school so it's very obvious that young people don't want to go to school. They go to school because they need to go. They need to learn. It's a preparation for higher education and for life in general. So this idea that we create an environment where they really don't have to pay attention, they don't have to listen, they don't have to sit up straight, they can basically pretend to study at home while the teachers pretend to teach them online. I mean, this is at the very least a very inferior brand of education, and now it's been going on for, for more than a year. So the cognitive uh, harm, I think, that's being caused to our students is considerable. I just hope that they open up 
Well, they couldn't, they couldn't do it fast enough. Mm. You know, um, at the top of the show, Dinesh, we mentioned that President Trump just announced a new communication platform. It's called From the Desk of Donald J. Trump, and he's going to be able to post pictures and videos. It, it, do you think that, like, you know, considering what he's faced in the past with all of the censorship, that that is going to be free from it there? Or does his website now have to worry about it as well? No, I think his website is completely free. I mean, websites in general are not vulnerable to this kind of censorship. So people will be able to get direct information from Trump. But I think the broader need is to create platforms that are real alternatives to Twitter and YouTube and Facebook so that the kind of heavy-handed censorship that affects all of us on those platforms, it, it gives not just Trump a place to go, but it essentially allows a kind of public forum for free discussion for democratic debate to resume once again in this country. We're, we're essentially living through a dark period where normal conversation on many controversial topics, not just hate speech, you can't talk about uh, remedies for COVID, you can't, I mean, there's a lot of topics that are just placed out of bounds and without explanation, you get demonetized over here, kicked off a platform over there. It's not just Trump's problem, it's a national problem.